What's up, guys? Welcome back to the podcast. Today we've got a special guest. We got some of the crew from uh, PSB Audio, Mr. Paul Barton. What's hey, everyone. Up, Paul? So, Paul, I've got I've some got of the some. Alpha series in for review, and I've been checking it out for the past month or and a half or so. And I believe you're going to give us a little history on the Alpha series and also a little history on PSB speakers. Yeah, I'm uh, going to start with a little PSB history for those of you who don't know the background to the company. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and then talk about the Alpha series, which uh, Shane is reviewing right now. It all started... Uh, as you can see, at a very young age, where I studied violin from age six until I, I took lessons until age 19, and um, acquired a good taste for music at a very young age. So music is sort of the way my brain has been wired. And then when I was 11 years old, as I got, got older and larger, <laughs> I needed from a half size to a three quarter size to a full size violin. And my father at the time really didn't have a lot of money. Um, he was a, a musician, a tenor, also played the cello and decided that instead of buying a violin, which was pretty expensive, he decided to make me one. And this is a, actually a, a painting of a of a photograph that was taken in that day. And actually it was painted my, by my, my daughter. And you can see up in the, just beside me there is the frame that, which the violin is built around. And after two years, a year making the tools for the violin and a year actually constructing the violin, it was completed when I was uh, 11 years old. And I, I still have that violin. Don't play it as much as I did when I was younger, but. I still do. Um, of course, the objectives for PSB was to, uh, you know, produce good loudspeakers. Uh, when I was in high school, I joined up with two high school buddies and myself. In the summer of 1972, we rented a place just north of the city I came from, a little town called St. Jacobs, Ontario, Canada. And we, you know, struggled for a few years trying to um, you know, establish a company. Um, the summer after, or sorry, the, the September after the summer we started, which was the summer after I finished high school, I uh, went, went back and went to the University of Waterloo Engineering. At the same time, um, running the company. Uh, and I was on a program which they have, which is called a, a co-op program. You work, you, you go to school for four months and then you find some related business that you're interested in, in engineering to get some uh, experience. So in, in my case, I employed myself and on my work terms, I worked at PSB and on my school terms, I went to school, not to mention that I actually worked every day, it just didn't work during the day when I was doing my school terms. And then in 1974, I was introduced to uh, uh, Dr. Floyd Tool, who at the time worked as an acoustician engineer uh, at the National Research Council, uh, which is a government funded institution facility, sort of a think tank in Canada. It's, it's in the capital of Canada, Ottawa. And it had a specialized division in the physics department uh, under acoustics and Floyd worked in that group. And I was introduced to Floyd uh, by a, a magazine editor in Canada at the time who was using the NRC to actually in the anechoic chamber you see here, uh, making measurements to evaluate loudspeakers for the Canadian magazine. And at the same time, they were actually doing some preliminary, you know, subjective evaluations after they did the measurements of the loudspeakers. And that sort of evolved. And by 1974, Floyd, when I met him, Floyd was already starting to do uh, subjective versus objective measurements of loudspeakers. And that is measuring them in the anechoic chamber 
and then comparing the results of subjective evaluations with those measurements. And really that's the foundation of what's happened in Canada. Here, here is a, an aerial view of the campus at the National Research Council. This river behind is the Ottawa River uh, near Ottawa. <laughs> And all of these buildings, there's about 65 of them, are in all of the sciences, like uh, aerospace, uh, physics, um, building research, where they study buildings and how to build them efficiently. Um, what other? There's also, um, well, just basic agri agriculture and medicine all of these different sciences uh, all in one place at the National Research Council. It, it employs about 1,000 PhDs in all of the sciences. And the facility that I use, I don't know if you can see my cursor, is just in this little area here. And it's a building called M37. Actually, the building on the right is the M50, which is the main building, the administrative building at the National Research Council. So based on these listening evaluations you know, here, listening is the final analysis of a speaker quality and is based for, and is the basis for selecting speakers for domestic applications. Um, how measurements relate to listening perceptions is always the question. And that was something we wanted to pursue. See, you know, why did that speaker sound better to us than that one? And then compare what it's doing with people's subjective liking or disliking the way it sounds. Um, so all of these parameters for doing listening evaluations were established at the National Research Council. Much of this work had been done around the world before, but I don't think uh, as comprehensive an evaluation using competent measurements, good interpretations of the measurements, and uh, comparing those with subjective people's whether they like them or not. Uh, and really, here are the conclusions. Most of the people, most of the time, agree on the relative qualities of a group of loudspeakers. Uh, that means that there really is no personal taste. There really is no East Coast sound, West Coast sound. Uh, musical taste and musical experience seem to be no prerequisites for being a good judge of sound quality. Meaning, you know, just because you say you have a tin ear, if you've got normal hearing uh, and you've lived in the world and listened to natural sounds, you are a good judge of sound. You can hear colorations. Sometimes it takes longer for people who aren't experienced, but when given the, the, the task to choose what they like, they seem to all gravitate towards good loudspeakers. There's no personal taste. And then finally, the a properly interpreted set of objective measurements, measuring the loudspeakers, correlates directly with subjective evaluations, listening to the loudspeakers. And boy, is that ever a lot of good information when designing a loudspeaker is it tells me what those target things need to be, what, what the most important things in making a speaker produce sound at a good value, good price. So, the history of the alpha was really, uh, it spans now uh, 30 years, no, 29 years. Actually, I, I started designing it in 1991 and it really was released early 92. And so it's, it's a 30 year old project starting with the very first alpha, which was reviewed by uh, John Atkinson in July of 1970, uh, 1992. And, uh, or actually it wasn't John Atkinson, it was Jack English, uh, a writer for the magazine at the time. And it got a lot of accolades and really launched our entry level product into the, the world, <laughs> all over the world. And it is a good success because it still continues to be a position in our product line with a similar philosophy on how it's built and what the priorities are in terms of making a good speaker for good value. And then uh, another generation came along, uh, Alpha Series, and here's an image of it at the time, 
just some slight cosmetic changes. I upgraded the drivers in it, uh, went from a half inch polyamide flare dome to a three quarter inch um, a soft dome. And then this went to an aluminum dome uh, with a polypropylene cone. This was the Alpha B1 and we built this one the longest period of time. And it also had a tower in the, in the line along with it and also a center channel. So the whole product category and what we're offering and the price points that we're offering has been a, a staple for PSB for 30 years. So this is the lineup that we're currently uh, talking about here. Uh, the only one that's not in this review is the smaller bookshelf, which we call the P3. And it uses a four and a half inch woofer instead of a five and a quarter. And it's available in two finishes, uh, black um, ash grain and uh, walnut grain. These are just some beauty pictures of it. So that's the P3, that's the smaller one. And I'll explain in a minute what the driver arrangements are. I, I know there were two things in your uh, unboxing video that I looked at. One was uh, the question about why the tweeter was below the woofer. Well, um, when it comes to, the, well, the fact that the tweeter is not in the same acoustic place as the woofer is, there is going to be a discrepancy in terms of the time it takes for the sound from the woofer and the time it takes from the sound of the tweeter to arrive at you. And that will be different depending on whether you're standing up or whether you're sitting down or whether you're on the floor. And because they're not in the same, they're not coincident. So, and it just so happens that you've, you know, you've got to crowd them as close together and cross the tweeter over as low as possible. Uh, in order for the, the two to sum, but by putting the tweeter below the woofer and using what I can describe as a fourth order linguist uh, acoustic filter, meaning the combination of the passive filter components and the woofer's natural roll off at the, and the tweeter's crossover components, passive components, and its natural roll off can be combined to create fourth order linguist shape and what that does is the lobe tends to tilt in the direction of the uh, woofer so when you're listening to this speaker when you're sitting down and then you stand up it sounds very similar and that's the reason why the tweeter is below now if I put a step baffle in I could put the tweeter above and play with that but the design is meant to be very simple. When it comes to the tower, by the way, because of its configuration, well, here, here is just a close, pi closer picture. Before I go into that, I'll just mention um, one thing of, that you mentioned or had in your uh, box opening was uh, the grill seemed simple, uh, which is what the intent was. And one thing, you, you, you can take advantage of with a grill of this slimness and this thickness is if it's close enough to the tweeter, which is where it affects it the most, the tweeter doesn't even see it because it's so it's less than a, a half a wavelength away from the source. So it doesn't reflect off the grill. And that way the grill virtually is transparent. The speaker sounds the same with the grill on or without the grill, it has no frame which can sometimes interfere with the uh, th a phenomena called diffraction and makes the response a little bit ragged. Uh, without a grill, or sorry, with, with, without a frame, you eliminate any problematic things with regard to that. Um, it is a fairly flimsy grill. Um, and the reason for its thickness is because of this transparency that I'm looking for. If the grill gets any thicker, it starts to interfere with the tweeter's response. Another thing I'd like to mention about the, uh, the, the tweeter is that it's a uh, aluminum dome with ferrofluid, which was mentioned in the uh, unboxing, and, but it's also in a waveguide. And one of the things you try and achieve with a loudspeaker 
that has more than one driver in it is the directivity, the dispersion of the woofer at its highest frequency where it matches up with the tweeter. You, and because the woofer is large, as the frequency gets higher, it starts to interfere with itself. So it has less dispersion. And the objective here is to get the best dispersion you can out of the woofer, but at the same time, match the dispersion at the crossover frequency of the tweeter so that off axis, they blend very well and there's no kind of roll off of the woofer and then the tweeter coming on strong because when you think about it, in a room, the first acoustical sound comes directly from the loudspeaker. The next sounds you hear come off what we call the early reflections, the sidewalls, the ceiling, the floor. And sidewall reflections way off axis, typically in a normal stereo setup, could be anywhere from 60 to 75 degrees off axis. Believe it or not, is the second sound you hear in the room. So, and because it comes so quickly in time, your brain hears it as one acoustical event. And I'll give you an example of that phenomena that our brain does when you're in a room. Sometimes I'll ask people, when you're, when you're talking to someone on a speakerphone, do you, do you know they're on a speakerphone? And most people say, yeah, I can tell they're on a speakerphone. And I say, well, how do you know they're on a speakerphone? What, what is it about the sound that, that makes you know they're on a speakerphone? They say, well, and we talked about a bit this, uh, this a bit earlier, uh, uh, I hear an echo. And, and, and yeah, they say, yeah, I, I hear an echo. And I say to them, well, when you're in that room, do you hear that echo? And they think for a moment and they say, well, no. And I ask them, well, why do you think you don't hear the echo when you're in the room, but you hear it when you're on the speakerphone? And quite frankly, it's a psychoacoustic phenomena. Uh, our brain has been programmed to integrate early reflections so that they don't cause a lot of confusion and allow us as, as mammals to survive because we can in a reverberant or reflective environment, we can target where the original sound comes from with great clarity. And so when you're listening to speakers in a room, what you hear off the sidewall combines with what you hear coming directly from the loudspeaker because it arrives in such a short time that you integrate those signals and the timbre of that combined sound is what you hear. So creating some controls over the directivity and the crossover point, as simple as it looks in this design, a lot of thought goes into that. So that's kind of the basis of the industrial design and the way it's been implemented. One other thing I'll mention is uh, the cone has a texture on it. Well, that embossing on the cone actually uh, kind of stiffens up the cone a little bit, which is a good thing. And there's other ways to stiffen cones. You can add mass and you can use exotic materials, but you can sort of play around and get something that's a little stiffer, even though the mass doesn't go up. And, it, you know, we don't want the mass to go up on a little speaker like this because we can, we want to get the, the most sensitivity out of it as possible. Another feature on the woofer you'll notice is there's a, the surround is not a half round. There's a little bit of a fillet in here. And if you did a cross section of this, you'd notice that it's thicker right at this, where it starts to swoop down. Uh, the other side is, is a sharp edge, whereas the top side isn't. So it adds a bit of mass all the way around the, the surround. And that in balance with the mass of the cone and the stiffness of the material uh, helps to stop the reflection from the center off the edge and reflecting back, which we call, it's a phenomena with a driver as the frequency gets higher, where it starts to break up and, and cause reflections. We call this an edge hole. It's a reflection off the edge. So creating a shape that con is conducive to adding a bit of mass around the outside tunes this thing quite nicely and sort of balances the whole thing out. 
Another thing I do in the, it's, it's a little more expensive than the typical white fluff that you see inside inexpensive loudspeakers. This is a material which is really a felted material, um, better known by us as a bicomponent material. It's, it's got uh, different densities of material in it. And it's used a lot in the uh, upholstery business because it's a fairly uh, uh, natural fiber. It's just natural fibers ground up and created, creating padding, but it works very well. Just to explain a little bit, that white fluff you often see in loudspeakers doesn't really do anything to damp the sound in, a, in an enclosure because the mechanism that damps sound using damping material, whether it's inside a loudspeaker or inside the anechoic chamber, which also has damping material, in that case fiberglass, which is also a good damping material, sometimes difficult to get people to handle fiberglass when manufacturing a speaker. And so this is a lot more user friendly as well. And um, the mechanism that, that damping material does inside the loudspeaker is that all of these fibers are, are not attached to each other. They're compressed against each other. And when you put sound through them and the air molecules are moving, the actually the fibers rub together and turn that energy into heat. That's the mechanism that takes place. That white material that you see in loudspeakers, all the fibers are bonded together. So if you try and tear it apart, you don't get fibers, you get all this mesh. Well, there's nothing to scrape together. It just doesn't scrape together. They're, they're attached to each other. So there's, no fr there's less friction. And so it doesn't make for a very good material. Hmm. Makes for good makes pillows. For pillows. Say again? Makes for good makes pillows. For good, makes for good pillows. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. And it's uh, hypoallergenic. So that, that's another benefit. Um, and this is just a review that came out not too long ago, or not a review. It was a, a summary of the uh, com compon um, recommended components from Stereophile this year, this past year. And the Alpha hit, got the budget component of the year. And John Atkinson at the bottom, you'll notice, also picked it as his choice for the year. So it's getting some, some good recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the T20, which you're working on, uh, yeah, is yeah. a very uh, similar configuration, except that it's a dual woofer cabinet. It has plenty of bracing inside. There's a brace behind each woofer, and then there's a brace towards the bottom of the cabinet. Same idea here, uh, good off-axis dispersion. This is a two-way, and I use the, instead of a two-and-a-half-way, and... A half way, and um, the tweeter is above because I use a, a Butterworth acoustic filter, which uh, the lobe tends to tilt in the other direction, depending on the phase. Uh, and because it's a dual, uh, a dual woofer system, um, the power handling is not, is not as big an issue. And the center channel, which also is quite well braced internally. And of course, all three of these models use that damping material in the proper places. Oh, one thing I'll do is go back to a slide that I had before and just talk to you. You'll notice that the, 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 the positioning of the damping material is such that I've put it so that some of it is in the center of the cabinet. So inside the cabinet, at some point, there's gonna be a standing wave relative to the air column inside the cabinet. and when that standing wave occurs, there's a high velocity point in a closed tube uh, that occurs at the center. So that's where the air is moving. And the best place to damp the air move or to, to damp the standing wave is to damp it in the position where the air is moving, not where the uh, on the wall, the, on the bottom in the top of the cabinet. Um, the air isn't moving. It's a high pressure point. So it can't, the, the, the fibers won't rub together, but they will rub together in the center of the cabinet. 
because the air is moving the most. At, at the uh, at the standing wave inside the cabinet. Let's talk about the height of those T20s. Yes. The height? Correct. The kind of mini towers. Yeah. 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 They're yeah they're, they're uh, sort of inobtrusive. I, I didn't see them in your setup. I guess that'll be shown when you do your yeah. review. Um, you know, getting it too big, it becomes uh, you know a cost proposition. It's trying to. The idea here is to try and optimize all of the parameters. Um, and one thing I was shooting for here was in a small tower, trying to get some some deep base out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you would you recommend tilting that upwards a little bit, the front of it? Like, give a little well, tilt. it depends on where you are and what your what you, where your ears are. Your the height of your ears mm -hmm. uh, in, in the room, the height of your chair. There might be some subtle improvements or change when you slant the speaker back, but that'll be something I would recommend you do just subjectively. Okay. I I can't predict all of those parameters without knowing how high off the floor your ear is. And uh, yeah, how, how tall your chair is and how tall you are and all of those mm -hmm. things. So it's something I would maybe recommend experimenting with. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. And then there's the uh, subwoofer. And one thing I'll just mention about subs is, and I tried to keep a pretty clean look. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the grills are made of uh, uh, steel and the magnets that hold the grill on are actually embedded uh, right in the baffle behind the, uh, the finish. So, oh, okay. yeah, so th that's why you don't see any magnets. Um, the magnets are buried inside. They're li uh, pretty powerful neodymium magnets. Yeah, they stick pretty good. And um, or what else was like? Oh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about subwoofer design. Um, Nowadays, you know, there's a lot of uh, DSP amplified chips available, which we implement one of them in this design. And what it allows me to do is two major things. Number one is to really intelligently know the limits of what the subwoofer can put out so that there's no risk of overdriving or making it go crazy because it can sort of know where its limits are and control it quite well. And, you know, lots of subwoofers have limiters, but this one is uh, something that's more related to something uh, can be described as dynamic EQ, so that it knows where its limits are and maintains the best EQ it can at the highest possible level, but keeps monitoring that based on the setup. The other thing, you know, a typical bass reflex loudspeaker, which is what this is, you, you want to tune it so that it's uh, a good balance between sensitivity and the 3 dB point down or the 10 dB point down. Well, when it's a powered sub, and of course, a, a, a bass reflex loudspeaker, how, how it behaves is that at the tuning frequency, the lowest frequency of the system before it starts to roll off, and that's where the port is doing the most work, at that frequency, the woofer hardly has to move at all. So with that in mind, I can apply, or I can tune the box down lower than I normally would tune it if it was a passive loudspeaker. And then I can EQ it to boost at the lowest frequency, which I've now tuned lower, knowing that the woofer will hardly have to work at all at those frequencies. And that's the beauty of designing a, a bass reflex system in a subwoofer to get the best bang for the buck and the bandwidth and the lowest distortion because you're able to make most of the work that the woofer would have to do, say if it were a sealed box, um, at the frequency where the woofer is hardly moving at all and the port is doing all the work. And that results in quite a bit lower distortion down to the tuning frequency of the loudspeaker. The undertuned or under overdamped of, of, uh, of the tuning and then making up for that overdamped response 
with EQ at, at the part tuning frequency. 